Wake Up America, time to stump the experts. Each Monday night at this time, H.J. Hines Company, makers of the famous Hines 57 varieties, presents Information, Please, with four experts ready and willing to answer your questions. Mail them to Information, Please, at 570 Lexington Avenue, New York 22, New York. We may edit them slightly, and in case of similarity, you'll have to accept our judgment as to which question we used. If we do use it, you'll get, with the compliments of H.J. Hines Company, $10 in war stamps and the Encyclopedia Britannica World Atlas. If the experts flop on your question, H.J. Hines Company sends you $57 in war bonds and stamps and a set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. All questions remain our property. Information, please, is presented under the supervision of Dan Golenpaul. And now, here's our master of ceremonies, Clifton Fadiman. Ladies and gentlemen, information, please, continuing along its carefree and unrehearsed path, is happy to present tonight as its board of experts, John Kieran of the New York Sun, the composer and pianist Oscar Levant, and the poet and author Franklin P. Adams. And they welcome as their guest the highly personable screen star whose most recent picture is Phantom Lady, Mr. Francho Tone. Now, we're going to begin with a question from Constance Misenheimer of Grand Rapids, Michigan. A musical question, gentlemen, and I think we should get all on this. That is three out of three. What beauty treatment is suggested by each of these songs that's going to be played? Let's have the first. What beauty treatment is suggested by this song? I have two hands, uh, Mr. Levant and Mr. Kieran. Mr. Kieran? Well, a manicure and a, a toenail polishing. Pedicure, job. pedicure. Yeah, pedicure, that's what it is, Mr. Levant. Also, a finger wave with bells on it. More, oh, yeah, I, uh, that would be true, but I should think either a manicure or, or a pedicure would do. Rings on my fingers, bells on my toes. And now the second one, this is a little harder. It's an old wave, isn't it? I don't mean an old wave. A wave. My curly They're headed. On an old wave. Is that my curly Running headed? Service down. My curly headed. Uh, my curly headed baby, which would recall what? What kind of a wave? N- name a the kind of wave you get in a beauty. It shop. all depends what kind of husband you have. I don't know. <laughs> Mr. A finger wave. I'm a, a full of fingers. Comparatively permanent wave. Yes, a permanent wave. So Mr. called. What other waves are there? Marcel. Is that different? Oh, you've been in Paris, 1890, Marcel. <laughs> <laughs> very nice then, Mr. Levin, very nice. <laughs> what uh, beauty treatment is suggested by this third song, gentlemen? Smile, smile, smile. Uh, Mr. Levant? Pack up your troubles in your old kid bag. That's the song, all right. Mud pack. Mud pack? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> pack up your troubles, paper pack. <laughs> Good enough. Did you have another answer, Mr. Adams? Yes, a dentifrice, but that would be on some other program. (laughs) (laughs) What a cautious guy you are, Adams. That gives us three out of three and sends us on to this one from Dorothy Capel of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Get two out of three. This is a historical question, gentlemen. Where were the following people during the American Revolution from, say, 1776 to 1781? Where was Alexander Hamilton during that period? Mr. Tone. Alexander Hamilton was George Washington's aide-de-call. That's quite right. Yes, he was right in the in the middle of the fight. Mr. Kieran? Well, he lost that job, but he, he uh, got another one just as good. He was a little bit late one day, so Washington uh, accepted his resignation. I didn't know that, Mr. Kieran. Is that right, Mr. Tone? You seem to know all about Alexander Hamilton. I guess Mr. Kieran knows him better than I do. <laughs> uh, how about Benjamin Franklin? What was he doing, and where was he during that period, Mr. Adams? He was in France a large part of that time. Uh, what was he doing there? He was minister. Yes, commissioner, I guess they called it. Uh, how long did he stay, do you know? Mr. Tone, you had your hand up for that one. He stayed until uh, about uh, 80, about 1780, uh, six, I think. Well, that's approximately right, 1785, and he was succeeded by uh, Thomas Jefferson in that same job. How about Thomas Jefferson? Where was he during 1776, Mr. Tone? He was the governor of uh, Virginia. Yes. Since, uh, I mean, from after the Declaration of Independence. Yes. Uh, First, he was in the Virginia House of Delegates from 1776 to 1779, and then became Virginia. How do you happen to know all this, Mr. Tone? Well, I I don't know. I've been reading up on it in preparation for this program. (laughs) 
Try this one for Mr. W.E. Walker of Toronto, Canada. <laughs> Can you recite for us three lines, verse or prose, preferably verse, that mention the names of different newspapers, American newspapers, let's say? Mr. Levant. These are times that try men's souls. Ah, very good. For the Times, yes. A lot of newspapers named Times, particularly the New York Times. Mr. Kieran? The sun sinks softly to its evening post. I guess your job is... <laughs> isn't... You're playing both of them, I yeah. see, Mr. Kieran. Uh, Mr. Tone. Isn't uh, there a line in Shakespeare, this is the lock, the herald of the morn? That's right. Say, that's very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Mr. Adams. The female of the species is more deadly than the male. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Mr. Adams, Mr. Levant. The, the sun is my undoing. No, it's, the sun is your undoing? We had the sun for Mr. Kieran, remember? He goes, goes the sun up once. You're not allowed to have it twice. Huh? No, I think that one sun is enough. Right. Well, that gives us five or six papers that... The world. The uh, world is too much with it. World is the world is waiting it. for the sunrise. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll have to telegraph my baby would be another one. How about this one for Mrs. Carl Hanton of Fort Myers, Florida? Get two out of three. I want you to translate these words into their original meanings, what they mean literally. And then what would your meal consist of if you translated these words into their literal meanings? Here's the menu. Pot au feu, a vol au vent, and a liederkranz. Now, if you had that literally, what would you be eating? Mr. Levant, want to start us off? I'll take vol au vent. Take vol bon. What have you got? A pot of fur is a soup with everything oh, in it. Oh, I want to know what these words mean, literally. Pot, uh, fire. A pot, pot in fire. Uh, <laughs> a pot on the fire. Fire, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you would start your meal, then, with a pot on the fire, and a mm. vol bon would mean literally what? Dead sweetbreads. A what? No. Calves' brains. I don't know what no, those mean. No, no. <laughs> Far away. What do the words mean, literally? Veal. It's veal. Now, what do the words mean, literally, Mr. Kieran? Flight in the wind. Flight in the wind. You would uh, begin with a pot on the fire, continue with a flight in the wind, which is what vol means literally, and a leader crunch literally would mean what? That's on 58th Street, a hall. I record that. A hall with very good mm -hmm. acoustics. Mm -hmm. And what would it mean, Mr. Adams, literally? A song crown. Song crown. That's yes. right. That's right. So that's what, what your menu would be. Now, what are these things <coughs> uh, actually? Mr. Adams, a pot of fur is what? Soup. Hot. Mm, well, it's uh, it's more than a soup. It's got a soup lot of a lot of meat in it. Yes, yeah. a kind of super soup. It's like a petty my meat almost. Uh, sort of that sort of thing. Yeah. Broth, meat, and vegetables yeah. all boiled together. And a vol au vent is what? Let somebody else do that now. Uh, Mr. Tone, have you ever eaten a vol au vent? I don't uh, remember it if I did. Uh, Mr. Kieran? No, I don't. I've eaten it. I take hash. Well, sometimes it's related to. What do you What do you say it is? Well, it's a. A sort of a light puff paste filled with a ragu of meat or sometimes fowl. It's calves' brains. I mean, you know what I mean. You're just you've got a fixation on calves' brains. No, they... <laughs> sweet breads, I mean. No, they don't they don't generally put sweet breads in. They might sometimes. And a Liederkranz is, Mr. Adams. Cheese. Is a cheese. It's uh, actually a Native American cheese. Although it sounds as if we're German. It's it a has a very American potent cheese. smell. And a very good one. It's got a potent smell, and it tastes very good. And now here's a question made to order for our Heinz 57 Varieties reporter, Ben Grauer. Tell us, Ben, what's the real meaning of this phrase, he doesn't know beans? Well, sir, that's slander, a colloquial, old-fashioned way of saying he doesn't know anything. Our ancestors evidently thought beans were a simple but pretty important matter, and there's a great deal in knowing your beans. Now, Heinz baked beans are the real oven-baked kind that fairly pop out of their deep brown coats. Every bean is mealy and crunchy as cracklin' bread. And that's why they drink in the sauce, Heinz spiced and savory tomato sauce, and are full of flavor clear to the heart. There's a warm friendliness about a big steaming dish of Heinz baked beans and a promise of hearty, satisfying fare that's especially good to think about on a cold, frosty evening. So at least once a week, Give your family a wholesome, old-fashioned treat, a Heinz baked bean supper. Thank you, Ben Grauer. And now, gentlemen, a question from George Ehrlich of Brooklyn, New York. This, again, is a musical question. We have to get two out of three. In each of these arias that are to be sung, can you tell us what the singer uses to accompany himself? That is in the original. Let's have the first. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Tone had his hand up at once. What was it, Mr. Tone? He accompanies himself with a mandolin. Uh, not quite a mandolin, I guitar? don't Guitar? A uh, guitar, yes. Mm -hmm. That's a related instrument, I suppose. Uh, what was being sung, Mr. Tone? That's Faust, uh, Mephistopheles' aria from... Uh, 
Faust. From Gounod's Faust, yes, the serenade. Uh, Whom is he serenading? Serenading Margarita. Margarita. I, 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 it is Faust. a guitar, and so we'd have to call that wrong. No, that's not wrong. I mean... Well, would you... A guitar and a mandolin are really somewhat different instruments, aren't they? Practically the same thing. Um, I mean, I'll get letters. They're not the same, are they? They really are. <laughs> <laughs> a guitar sounds better. Isn't there more music in a guitar, Mr. It Lamar? has a deeper, deeper and more offensive sound. Uh... <laughs> The mandolin, of course, I immortalized by a song I wrote. Lady, play a mandolin, so it's all right with me. Well, well I don't know whether you immortalized it, but you've resurrected it anyway. Mm, you, pick, you pick on a mandolin with yeah. a pick. And you get kind of a tinny sounds as compared with a guitar. Well, let's yeah. try the next one. Next they don't really area. play it on a stage anyway. I have Mr. Tone and Mr. Levant. I'll try Mr. Tone again. Well, I don't know what he's accompanying himself with, but that's uh, from uh, uh, Don Giovanni. 100% right. He's very good. He is good. And he was right the first time. No, no. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let, you, I'll let you pick this one up, Mr. Levant, and tell us what he accompanies himself on. Well, he's a pretty sexy man, Don Giovanni. I don't want to go into what he accompanies himself with. <laughs> well, how shall I put it? Amazing? Well, then, it, it, it's not a guitar or a mandolin. It's something else, obviously. No, I didn't say that. Well, then, it's a guitar. No, it's a mandolin. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew a man who accepted a hint with greater awkwardness than you did. I have to call that wrong. It's, uh, it is a, a mandolin, Don Giovanni. Serenading Donna Elvira's maid, who is not named, I guess, in the opera. And now the third aria. That's the Levant. That's uh, Figaro by Mozart, and uh, it's a cavatina. And I don't know what he accompanies himself by. It all depends who, uh, I don't know. What does he accompany himself? Ah, you're asking me, aren't you? You know, usually Bruno Walder strums a chord on a harpsichord. And it's quite nice. It is nice, but it's not the answer to the question. Mr. Tone, do you no, have any I, idea? I only had it halfway up. Well, it's, it's Count Almaviva, as, as you say, in uh, Mr. Levant, in the Nazi de Figaro, Mozart. And he accompanies himself on a, a sort of yardstick, playing it as though it were a guitar. Leave the war out of it. Uh, What's it, a yardstick? A yardstick? Mm. Three feet? You know what a yardstick is. You accompany yourself on that? Well, it's just a joke. It's kind of a joke. Oh, oh, it, oh. it isn't real. <laughs> Well, I think we messed that one up beautifully. Huh? <laughs> a free wrong out of three. Fifty-seven varieties sends fifty-seven dollars in war bonds and stamps to Mr. Ehrlich and a set of the Britannica. You know, we were pretty bad on that. No, we were good. I mean, we knew everything except what except they the accompanied themselves on. That. <laughs> <laughs> well, you put up a good fight, Levan, anyway. Try this one for Mrs. Gertrude Donovan of Detroit. Gentlemen, is there anything peculiar about this month that we are now in, Mr. Adams? Yes, Mr. Kieran? Yes, there's... Uh, Every four years is an extra day in February. Yeah. This is a leap year. It's a leap year. Very well. Will Can you, you marry me, Mr. Federman? <laughs> oh, this is so sudden, Oscar. It is not. <laughs> you've been after me for all this all time? All the time, yeah. <laughs> you certainly have managed to disguise your sentiment. <laughs> uh, can you name these girls in literature who did the proposing, this being leap year? One who lived in Illyria did the proposing. What girl was that, uh, Mr. Kieran? Viola. Viola? Now, well, let's see. I worked that work back, but it was a girl. That oh, didn't... that no, it was the, uh, uh, the 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 girl to whom she was sent uh, as a page for the Duke That's who right. did the proposing. That's right. Uh, no, I'm trying to think of Did her name. Come, yes. Olivia was it? Olivia is right. Yes, yes. and she was uh, wooing. She Who? was wooing Viola, uh, thinking that because she was disguised as a page that she was a man, but then she married. Uh, Viola's twin brother, who yeah. very happily happened along. Oscar, do you understand this? Is that no, that's you? very neurotic. It must be by Shakespeare. That uh, is by Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> this is more difficult to understand than that yardstick stuff. Now, uh, that's quite right, Mr. Kerr. Who Olivia accompanied Olivia him, booing Mother. Cesario, who was really Viola. <laughs> now, uh, can you name these girls in literature who... This one who lived in literature and did the proposing. One who lived in Massachusetts. Mr. Tone. Was that Priscilla? Priscilla is right, yes. Very good, Mr. Tone. What was her last name? That I don't know. You never need to know the girl's last name, do you, Mr. Adams? Priscilla Alden. That was after no, she was uh, married. Mullins. John Alden. Mullins, Mullins. yes, uh, in the courtship of Miles Standish. Now, how about one who lived in London and did the proposing? One who lived in London. Have to get all on this, gentlemen. Was that uh, by... Uh, 
I'm not articulate. Let it go. You're articulate enough. Too much so sometimes. How about it? One who lived, Mr. Would every uh, woman. The one that proposed to Barkus. Barkus? I think no. he did the proposing. He did. Though. And Very I guess often. it wasn't in London, was it? Mr. Kieran? No, Mr. I don't know what it was. Huh? What every woman knows was in Scotland, so that's not right. Well, how about Man and Superman? Remember the heroine, oh. uh, Anne Whitfield, in George Bernard Shaw's That's play? a little like Viola, happily coming along. That's very complicated. It is complicated. Yeah. Well, we got that one wrong. Let the Heinz 57 pays out $57 in your bonds and stamps to Mrs. Donovan and a set of the Britannica. Try this one from Alice Harris of Chicago. Name the book or play in which an ex-barmaid is married to a cabinet member. An ex-barmaid is married to a cabinet member. Mr. Levant. Random Harvest. That's stretching. Uh, they, everybody hard. loses his mind in it, but I think later on it ends up that way. Maybe so. I don't remember. Well, don't, don't say that. You'll get a letter from MGM. I'd love to get a letter <laughs> from MGM. Probably worth money. Mr. Tone, does it come back to you? It's the gorgeous uh, Hussey. Hussey. Remember that mm. Peggy O'Neill Eaton who uh, mm. became wife of the John Henry Eaton who became Secretary of War under Jackson? How about uh, the book or play? Got that one wrong. Name the book or play in which a missionary marries a drunk. Mr. Levant. Elsa Lanchester married her real husband, the beachcomber. That's the one, yes. Charles Lawton. Charles Lawton, yes. Mm. The beachcomber. How about a book of play in which the boss marries her employee? The boss marries her employee, Mr. Levant. Any picture with Rosalind Russell. Her girl... <laughs> <laughs> My golly, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Her girl, Friday. Her man, Friday. Everything Friday. And uh, how about Lady in the Dark? I'll take that. Lady in the Dark. Yes, Moss Hart's play. That's the situation there, too. That gives us two out of three. Try this one from Marion E. Whirl of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Who celebrated their marriages in these unusual ways? Uh, this couple uh, sit on top of a haystack as part of their marriage celebration. Mr. Tone. Oklahoma. Actually, is the, it in Oklahoma? Uh, You're on the right track, Mr. Adams. Well, green grow the lilacs. Yes, from which Oklahoma was made. Have you seen Oklahoma... I have oh, you got in, did you? He saw Green Grow the Lilacs, too. He was in it. Uh, were you in it, Mr. Tone? In Green Grow the Lilacs, yes. yes. Well, you, uh, there's no I problem. I sat on top of the haystack. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes, it's in, it's in the play Green Grow the Lilacs by Lynn Riggs. Uh, what part did you play? Was it the part known as Curly? In Curly, Oklahoma? Yes. I didn't see the original. With a permanent wave. <laughs> <laughs> That's straightened out since then, hasn't it? How about this one? Uh, this couple go moonlight dancing on the beach. Go moonlight dancing, Mr. Kieran. The owl and the pussycat. That's right, they do. What are the... Can you quote the lines that prove in it? Hand in hand, uh, uh... On the edge of the sand. On the edge of the sand, they dance by the light of the moon. That is the one. Quite right. Now, what, uh... In this case, the, the husband starves his wife as part of a marriage celebration. It seems a little odd. Starves his wife. Husband starves his wife. Well, Mr. was she too fat? <laughs> no, no, he just enjoyed it, that's all. I don't know that one. Uh, Mr. Kieran knows it. Mr. Tone. Was it the Taming of the Shrew? That's right, Mr. Tone. Good word. She is. What's happening to the rest of you boys? Taming of the Shrew. And what are the two, who are the uh, characters involved, Mr. Tone? Uh, Petruchio and Catherine. Petruchio and Catherine, uh -huh. yes, quite right. Well, that gives us three out of three. Now, here's a real opportunity for our Heinz reporter, Ben Grauer. You should be able to tell us, Ben, what fuel our ancestors considered best for baking beans. Black alder twigs. Yes, according to New England tradition, there was nothing like a long and cozy sojourn in an oven heated by black alder wood to bring out the best in a pot of beans. That best is a mellow, nut-like flavor, a wonderful, sauce-thirsty mealiness, just like you get in Heinz oven-baked beans. Of course, I'm not implying that Heinz great bean ovens are fired with alder wood, their ovens are the last word in up-to-the-minute scientific ingenuity. But the principle is the same. Heinz beans get a thorough baking. And that's why they taste so much like the old-time baked beans that brought joy to the husks and strength to the good right arms of our elders. Now, right now, you'll be glad to know that bean baking is going on at a great rate in Heinz kitchens because more containers have been made available and last year's bean crop was excellent. You may not always be able to get all you want, but we can assure you that more delicious Heinz oven-baked beans are on their way to your grocer's shelves. And that's good news to all of us. Thank you, Ben Grower. And now, gentlemen, uh, how about trying this one? Uh, from Harry Lewis Selden of Forest Hills, New York. 
Who are these down-at-the-heel characters of poetry whose clothing is described in these words? The first phrase, unwomanly rags. Unwomanly rags. Mr. Adams. That's from the song of the shirt. Quite right. Can you quote the lines? Dwelled in unwomanly rags. Uh, I forget the next line. Well, you've got practically the whole thing. A woman sat in unwomanly rags, plying her needle and thread, with fingers weary and worn, with eyelids heavy and red, and so forth. Yes, from uh, Tom Hood's Song of the Shirt. Now, how about one whose clothing is described as uh, shreds and patches? Shreds and patches. Mr. Tone. The wandering minstrel. That's the one, yes. A thing of shreds and patches from what? Opera. From the Mikado. From the Mikado. Is there any other, Mr. Adams? It's from Shakespeare first. It is from Shakespeare first. Who uh, speaks? I think it may be from Hamlet, but I'm not it sure. Is quite right, Mr. Adams. Mr. Kieran? Well, it's Hamlet speaking of his uh, uh, unlovely uncle. Yes, King Claudius. Quite right. How about all tattered and torn? All tattered and torn. Who is so described? Mr. Adams. Uh... Well, it uh, rhymes with a cow with a crumpled horn. It does, uh, if you go far enough into the rhyme. Uh, well, it's the this man. This is the something all tattered and torn. Yes, what did this man all tattered and torn do? you got a sensor operating against him. He was him. tossed by the... Uh... No, he, he kissed the maiden all forlorn, Mr. Oh, Adams. He kissed the maiden all forlorn. Uh, that gives us three out of three. Try this one from Samuel Hertzberg of New York City. What is the reason, gentlemen, for these important changes? The total popular vote for president in New Jersey increased from 494,646 in 1916 to 901,827 in 1920. What was the reason for that change, Mr. Levant? Women. Quite right. There were a lot of votes at the end of 1919, I think, as an antidote to prohibition. <laughs> Uh, quite right. The woman suffrage amendment was passed in 1919, and that <laughs> almost doubled the vote, at least in New Jersey. Now, here's another change. What was the reason for it? The census of 1860 showed that the population of Virginia was 1,596,318, whereas the census of 1870, which was 10 years later, showed a drop to 1,225,163. What was the reason for that change, Mr. Kieran? Formation of West Virginia. That's quite right. Uh, how did that happen? How did that come about? Well, it was in the, uh, Virginia was uh, split up in the Civil War. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, after the Civil War, why, uh, a new state was formed, West Virginia. Matter of fact, it was right during the Civil War in 1863 that West Virginia was admitted, Mr. Adams. And uh, it was supposed to be done, and was charged it was done for political reasons to get uh, more electoral votes. Scandal. Mr. Levant? That's what I thought. You going to bring up that old story? Yeah, they do that uh, to uh, redelegate power in, in uh, different sections, like uh, Congress sections. That's quite It's possible. funny. I'm inarticulate. I don't say what I want to. That's what I mean by being... I, I talk a lot, but I don't say what I mean. Oh, yes, you do. You say it often enough to get a lot of things right. Mr. Levant, how, how about this one? See if you can be articulate on this one. The population of New York City, according to the census of 1890, was 2,507,414. And in 1900, that was 10 years later, it had increased to 3,437,202. Mr. Levant. Brooklyn. No? <laughs> <laughs> you can't make Brooklyn responsible for everything, Mr. Levant. Uh, well, in effect, in effect, that's true. The boroughs got together. Yes. So, Mr. Kieran? I was going to say, they took in the five boroughs. Then. Yes. Well, I could say Brooklyn. That's nice, I think. Well, uh, there, were, there was also Richmond and yeah, Bronx Staten and Queens. Yeah. The consolidation into Greater New York took place in 1898. That gives us three out of three on that one. Olive W. Bastion of New Orleans sends this one in. We have to get all on this. Where in literature or the movies does a character give vent to a burst of emotion in these words? The first is, my emperor, my emperor. Mr. Levant. In a song by Schumann, words by Henrik Heine, the two grenadiers. Yes, you're just as articulate as you need be. Well, I know that one, that's why. <laughs> Try this. Here is a case in which a character sings out or cries out, England, my England. Where does that 
exclamation take place? England? Not in the Chicago Tribune, I don't think. <laughs> Probably not. Mr. Tone? Well, that's a poem by uh, Henley, which uh, I quoted in one picture I was in. In what picture was it, Mr. Tone? The Lives of a Bengal Lancer. Right, I don't think that will answer the question. Didn't somebody else ever use it? No. No. Uh, I guess there's no one else but you, Mr. Tone. What are the, what are the lines that you, that you uh, sang out in that picture? Ever the faith is thine, England, my England. I don't remember. That's that enough. You're through with that picture. Contract's over. <laughs> and how about my son, my son? Who says that and where? Mr. Adams? Uh, Absalom, my son, my son. Yes. Very good, Mr. Adams. In the Bible. From? In David, the Bible. David says it. King David says it. Yes. King David on the death of, of Absalom, his son. Do you know how he was killed? No, By no. a tree. He, he uh, was riding and the branch caught his head. You make a sound as if it had just happened yesterday, Mr. Adams. <laughs> Uh, that gives us three out of three. Now, how about this one from M.S. Graver of Lancaster, Pennsylvania? According to history or legend, gentlemen, what famous American document was written on a drumhead by an army campfire? Famous American... Mr. Tone. Uh, Thomas Paine's first crisis paper. Yes, very good, Mr. Tone. Uh, and it like contains... Mr. Levant quoted it, the opening sentence. Which is what? Ago. These are the times that try men's souls. Yes, we uh, can't quote that often enough, perhaps. How about this one? Uh, what American document was written, according to the legend, on a high hat in a railroad train, using it as a support? Mr. Kieran. It isn't so. Uh, <laughs> you mean uh, Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address? Well, I said according to legend. It isn't yes. true. It isn't true. You're sure of that? Quite sure. Uh, when was it written, uh, according well, to it was, uh, it was written the night before he spoke in the hotel. At least the, the, a draft is preserved of, uh, of uh, that uh, part of the speech. And uh, then he rewrote it more than once. Yes. You're taking all the romance out of it, you know, Mr. Kieran. But I I'm suppose sorry. it's going to be accurate. Uh, the legend is nicer, but I'm sure that Mr. Kieran's explanation is the more correct. How about this one? What American document was written on an enemy vessel in a harbor? Uh, Mr. Tone. The Star-Spangled Banner. The Star-Spangled Banner by Francis Scott Key. Yes, I think we might have time for this one from Lieutenant Commander Paul B. Hartenstein of South Arlington, Virginia. Where in literature was each of these suggestions made and by whom? Let us sit upon the ground. Who said that, Mr. Kieran? King Richard II. Very good, yes. Let's all take poison and die. Who said that? Let's all take poison and die. Who made that suggestion? Mr. Tone. Was it Macbeth? No. That was in a play with Mr. Tone, That's I think. quite right. The House of, Con Con of Connolly. The House of Connolly, yes. Yeah. Uncle Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, who said, let us die to make men free? Who made that suggestion? Mr. Adams. Julia Ward Howe. Yes, and where? In what? The battle Hymn of the, the, the Republic. Battle Hymn of the Republic. That's quite right. That gets a three out of three. And I guess that's all we'll have time for. Thank you, Francho, for lending a little tone to the fun this evening. <laughs> well, we got by on that. Now I know why you're called a pundit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, the H.J. Hines Company has paid out uh, $114 in war bonds and stamps and two sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Next week, Mr. Adams and Mr. Kieran will welcome as their guests two famous authors, the great American novelist Edna Ferber, and the co-author of the Broadway hit One Touch of Venus, Mr. S.J. Perlman. Remember, send your questions and the correct answers to information, please, at 570 Lexington Avenue, New York 22, New York. And now, Ben Grower. There's nothing quite so satisfying these winter days as a bowl of your favorite soup, steaming hot and rich in flavor and nourishment.